Good evening and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a political podcast that has done far naughtier things than run through a field of wheat. And I'm joined as always by my co-host Rob. How are you, Rob? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. As I say, I've been uh, enjoying uh, enjoying the delights, uh, you know, the ancient delights of, of, of a Roman bath, um, you know, almost taking us back as far as uh, some people might want to take this country back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does sound like a uh, quite an experience. I know Bath is a lovely city. It's very pretty. I hope you did all the nice little Georgian bits. Um, did you do the circle as well, the Royal Parade? The circus and the Royal Parade. Yeah, I did. Went up and saw both of those. It's been a while since I've done all these touristy things. I've been to Bath kind of shopping more often than I've been to visit like that. So yes, it was good to just wander around and take in, um, you know, the kind of opulence we won't have in March 2019. Um, yes, yes, oh, I'm, well, I'm not depressed about anything at all. <laughs> no, no, of course not. I think we, yeah. Well, I've been I've been living back in 1899 most of this weekend, trying to play bits of uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 in between decorating the house. So yeah, I've also know what it's like to travel back in time for a bit. So uh, yeah, looking forward to reliving those days soon. <laughs> okay, so we'll go straight on into headline quickfire. And uh, this week, I just wanted to start off, I, I like the idea of maybe starting off with a nice bit of news each week before we go into like the meat of it all. So uh, baby joy for Ruth Davidson in The Scotsman on Saturday. Uh, yeah, this is the news that the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Ruth Davidson, has had her first child uh, with her partner. Um, she's in a same-sex partnership, um, but it was Ruth who decided to uh, be the person who was pregnant in that one. Uh is really lovely news and it might be of like particular interest for people who are following uh, politics and a next potential conservative leader. Uh, Ruth Davidson is seen by many in the centre of the party as a possible new leader. Uh, she's the kind of person who's been on Have I Got News For You and proved herself to be quite amicable. You know, she seems quite down to earth. Uh, and she also uh, did what many thought was impossible back in 2017 by uh, making the Conservatives actually gain seats in Scotland. Um, although she's not an MP herself, uh, she was sort of seen as the figurehead of the party up there. Uh, and many think that it was the Conservatives winning votes up in Scotland that actually helped them to at least win the 2017 general election and not fall back even further behind Labour. I think the one thing that's holding her back in her possible leadership challenge is that she's not a sitting MP. So a bit like like Nicola Sturgeon, who is the leader of the SNP, she's not an MP. So the Conservative constitution would mean that Ruth would have to become an MP before she had any chance of leadership. Uh, but she's certainly one of the the front running candidates and maybe like those who prefer a more centrist leader if you were going if you had to compare if you had to be ruth or somebody like reese mogg or david davis uh, she might be seen to be quite a unifying uh, contender yeah so some good news out of scotland and um, am i right in saying they also sometimes move people around like if i mean i, I don't know how that would affect like her because you know obviously she does well in scotland but i know that they do they do like parachute people into seats and stuff in but in, in all the parties so there's always a possibility something she could be dropped in a safe seat to become an mp right yeah certainly but um there aren't one there aren't that many safe seats up in scotland and two she'd have to do it they'd have to do it sort of like in a by-election before the next general election if they wanted her to be leader it would be you'd have to pull a few strings at least for it to happen but yeah it, it's not out the it's not you know it's not impossible our next headline from the independent two-tier britain uh yeah this is a recent report that sort of says um, that despite Theresa May sort of vowing to, you know, I think she started off her premiership saying that she would work for both the poor um, in Britain and help to sort of get rid of some of the thing, issues that divide the nation. Um, quite the opposite is true when you look at the statistics. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, basically found that you've got a two-speed society, which means that the rich have gotten richer whilst the poor are getting poorer or at least trapped in a cycle of poverty. Uh it's a little depressing to hear that news, um, particularly after, you know, Theresa May said that she'd vowed to fight it. But I think we can all agree that she's had some sort of other things on her plate that might have stopped her pushing those um, reforms forward. Uh, and I think it's sort of something that was, you know, it's criticised under Tony Blair's government as, as well, that this was, you know, a sort of a two speed Britain was happening, you know. 
So it's a difficult one to solve. It's certainly much a larger economic and social problem as well as a political one. Um, but, it, but it's worrying to hear that the, ri- the gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider. I mean, it's not just that headline. I've seen stories on this all over the place. Uh, I know it's a problem in the US right now as well. Like, it seems that the divide between the rich and poor is getting greater and the real wages haven't necessarily increased for the average person um, for a while now. Um, knock-on effects of the recession, etc. But um, it's 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 definitely something you, you can dive into deeper if you want to go read The Economist or something like that. So our next headline in The Times, May picks civil service chief amid Brexit crisis. Uh, yes, this is the news that uh, Theresa May has decided to pick um, Sir Mark Sedwill um, as her Brexit chief. He used to work for Theresa May when she was in the Foreign Office. Uh, there was a little bit of... Um, sort of hoo-ha about this uh, that suggested that maybe it was just Theresa May getting a friend in rather than the person who's best qualified to do the job. Um, but it certainly shows that she she wants to work with somebody who she's known in the past. May still sees it is very important that she gets her will across in the Brexit negotiations. Um, which might surprise some people, particularly when she's been so criticised in recent months. She's had her Chequers deal rejected by a large part of her own party and rejected by the EU. So you might think that she'd go for maybe a more, I don't know, consolatory figure um, or somebody who might have a slightly different point of view so she could get some new ideas in. Um, But this appointment at least shows that she's kind of trying to stamp her authority again. Um, and proves that the civil the civil service within the UK, which has quite an important role in Brexit negotiations, um, they're, they're taking their role seriously as well. Um, I don't know if you... If there was another news story that I don't know if you heard about, but the, the civil service were really kicking off at MPs, saying that we do our, our job is to serve... Um, is to serve the will of the prime minister or the will of our minister that we're in charge of. It doesn't matter if we voted remain in the election. We're not trying to push a remain agenda. We're just trying to give you all the information needed. Um, And some sort of more Brexity MPs were getting quite annoyed or there were even stories that they would shut certain civil servants out of their offices when a decision about Brexit had to be taken because they didn't want to hear their advice, Uh, which is worrying in a way that they're not taking like just advice or taking facts they're relying on their own knowledge um particularly when we're facing one of the biggest constitutional (laughs) changes in our generation you probably want to have that knowledge aboard so a lot of things going on in that story um i think the big takeaway is that yeah theresa may is trying to get her way um but i think if somebody else was to take over then uh, sir mark said well might lose his job rather swiftly yeah yeah no, I mean, yeah, it's 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 not something I had much information on before I saw the headline. Uh, I'll be honest, but it's uh, yeah, it's in, it's interesting the level of kind of trying to keep every, people on side, but also making. I mean, we've said before she has a difficult job, right? Yes, she's yeah. trying to please everyone, and she can't. <laughs> I think is the summary. <laughs> I mean, I know that's true for most um, most political leaders, but it it seems even more tr- true at the moment because there's. So many, as we said multiple times, so many people have their own view of what Brexit should be. Um, where even if that's even if they're for it, let alone against it. So yeah, it's tricky. So following on, uh, still on the Brexit theme, uh, in the Independent again, No Deal Brexit would cost the young a hundred thousand pounds. What's that all about, Rob? Uh, yeah, this is the story uh, in the eye that um, a No Deal Brexit would cost uh, young people uh, about a hundred thousand. Yes, it's cost young people more than 100k, which sounds dramatic, but that's by 2050. So they're sort of taking a very long view of that. Um, it's like lifetime earnings, right? It's Yes. Yeah. As, as with most things, they're not just suddenly going to take 100k because I would be like, oh, gosh, I haven't even got I haven't even got 20 quid. Where am I going to get 100k from? That seems terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it's it's specifically talking about a no deal Brexit. So that's assuming Theresa May can't make a deal with the EU, um, that they'd lose around about uh, 18 to 21 year olds would lose around about £400 a year and 22 to 29 year olds would lose around about £500 a year. Uh, That might come from a variety of different factors from uh, 
food prices going up to, uh, you know, a lack of potential earnings or job opportunities that may be uh, created by the impact on Britain's uh, gross domestic product. Uh, the kind of irony of this story is that, you know, the young who might be the most severely affected um, were the people who most strongly voted to remain. So it would sort of be a double blow to them. Um, so it does a streak of, you know, it does sort of like stink of being the most unfair of scenarios. I will just say with like a, a, a little caveat on this story, uh, as with most Brexit stories, it's hard for anyone to tell you exactly what's going to happen. Um, I think there was a lot of talk in the referendum itself of people like, I don't trust experts or, you know, the, the I think what Michael Gove was trying to say when he said that was you can't believe all the predictions you hear. A lot of the time financial predictions are wrong. So uh, you can't take that away. But certainly as a person who falls into one of those age brackets, it's, you know, it's it's worrying. It's frightening that you know, a large part of my potential future might be might be taken away uh, by, by something I didn't support. So, uh, and I'm sure there's many other young people who feel that way as well. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think I have anything to add there. It's just, we expect a no deal Brexit to not be great from a financial point of view. Um, as you say, I think food prices going up is one that I am concerned about mostly. We just really don't know how it's going to affect a lot of these things. No, I think, I think it's the not knowing that's the scariest. But actually, if you just... We just knew what was going on. Um, I think there was a, sorry to link this into another story, but there was um, one in the BBC that, that kind of said that businesses have got to a point now where they're like, right, we've got to put a halt on investment because we've reached the stage now where we have to wait what happens in the negotiations. Um, and it is really getting to that that crunch point. Once a lot of businesses start taking that decision, it's a time for the general public to sort of wake up and go, oh, okay, maybe we, you know, Maybe we should, you know, try a bit, bit more, or at least be prepared ourselves, just, just in case. So our next headline is well, we've got these are two linked headlines. Um, so uh, I think I'll do them in the order we have them. So Green outed in the Lords from the Metro, and in the Daily Mail, the fall and fall of Sir Philip Green, but the Sir was crossed out in that headline um, because there have been calls for him to be stripped of his knighthood. What's going on there? Uh, yeah, this was a this was a story that first broke in the Daily Telegraph. Um, but when it broke there, we didn't know who it was about. So the Daily Telegraph ran with a big uh, front page article with a blackout silhouette said, we've discovered that a top businessman in the country has done some sort of me too. Uh, he has some me too allegations against him that not only was... Uh, that, that he, I can't remember the specific allegations. I don't think even the paper was allowed to print the specific allegations um, or name the person. Um, but what the Telegraph said is they'd been stopped by a legal gagging order, uh, which meant that the person in question had paid a large amount of money um, and through a legal process to say, no, you can't, you can't reveal my name because I'm innocent until proven guilty. That's what these gagging authors are kind of meant to do. They're meant to protect someone's identity to stop them having all, you know, all the, these potential scandals talked about. Uh, and many people think that's really, really unfair. It's a rule that seems to protect the rich um, and the poor have no access to that kind of protection. Uh, so in the Lords, uh, I believe it was, oh goodness, I've forgotten his name. Uh, no, it was uh, Hain. Um Payne said that he would go against the gagging order as it was in the public interest to know who this person was. Uh, And the person in question was uh, Sir Philip Green, a former business owner. Um, He'd owned BHS, which was rather successful uh, sort of uh, homeware store in the 90s. Um, And he'd be given his knighthood uh, in the I think it was in the early 2000s, basically before the financial crash, where. Uh, people sort of considered great businessmen. He's done, you know, made a lot of wealth for the country. Let's give him a knighthood. After everything sort of came crashing down, um, he was seen in a much less favourable light. Uh, when he lost British home stores, I think he sold it for a pound in the end because the debts were so big. Um, a lot of the workers there ended out ended up losing out on their pension funds, uh, while Sir Philip Green, surprise, surprise, walked away with all his money intact, scot free. Uh, so that's why he sort of there have been calls for him to be stripped of his knighthood. 
Uh, now he's got these new allegations against him uh, where he's had front pages where they paired him with Harvey Weinstein. I think that was a headline in the mirror where they showed the two of them side by side saying that he's done these sort of like awful Me Too allegations. It kind of adds to the scandal around an already unpopular figure. Uh, so that's it from Philip Green's side. I think the other side is are gagging orders even effective anymore if politicians can take it into their own hands and say it's in the public interest? Uh, I think I, I don't agree with gagging orders, as you may have guessed. Like I don't think they're a, they're a good thing. Um, but certainly, uh, I know that Peter Hayne has sort of like risked some legal recourse against him, and he might get sued by Sir Philip Green for for what he's done. And so I think that's just a little story to look out for there. If if he does get some backlash uh, from Philip Green against Peter Hayne, uh, then it will be very interesting how the media report these stories in the future. And our final headline, um, before we move on to our main story tonight, from the uh, Financial Times weekend, Tech Gloom Drags Down Wall Street. Uh, yeah, this is the news that uh, sort of on Friday, um, the US market and global markets in general sort of saw a big slump uh, as investor worries started to creep through the world. Um the, the tech fears that are mentioned uh, on the front page is that the fact that a couple of tech giants such as Amazon and Google um, have released some figures that suggest they've got weaker than usual sales. I think Amazon in particular um, fell more than 7%, basically stating that they didn't think they would sell as much as usual um, for the upcoming Christmas season. And all, all of this, this sort of slump in the stock market as far as as far as i can see i'm i'm not a business analyst i'll profess you know as so i'll preface this this statement here um with that but from from what i can tell is that people feel that the us stock markets for a while um have been sort of overinflated that they've they've looked better than they actually are and everybody was expecting a dip at some point and it started to come now uh, some people think that this might actually be Trump's chickens kind of coming home to roost. Um, he's put a lot of trade tariffs on China and you've got this ongoing story about a trade battle. And now people start to fear that growth might slow in China and in the US um, as costs rise due to the car due to the tariff and for labor shortages as well. And if China isn't growing or if the US isn't growing, if those two powerhouses aren't, then that has a big effect on the rest of the world and the rest of the global stock market slump as well. Um, it is a bit worrying to think that giants like Amazon and Google, I think if you just if you told me a year ago that they'd start losing money, I'd go like, what? No, they're just they're two behemoths, aren't they? They're just they're immovable objects. You think they're going to be around forever. So to have that sort of if you're an investor, I think you would see that as a sure bet. And to see them suddenly lose money has people spooked and worried about what that means for the rest of business as a whole. Um, it also probably couldn't come at a worse time for Trump. I think he's quite often tweeted, you know, he's, he's pointed to the stock market as a as sort of like a barometer of his, his success. So if it starts to go down just before the midterm elections, that, that's worrying and could have some impact on how people see his economic competence. I think I remember reading at the time when Trump took over. So Trump has often claimed uh, benefits to the stock market from him coming into power. But there was a lot of talk about how actually a lot of it was laid down during Obama's term and was kind of coming to fruition. There is a delay sometimes, although it was seen as I think there was some short term benefit for Trump himself because there were business people being like, oh, well, he's a businessman. He will, you know, he, he will encourage business interests in what the government is doing and so on. But I think there was also a pointing out that there is a long term effect um, on the financial uh, markets of, of like, you know, programs that get people into work, et cetera, lead to people being able to find better jobs and, and generate more income and so on and so forth. Sorry, um, no, I was just going to agree with you. I think there were some very interesting graphs that sort of showed the the progress of like US debt and US unemployment. And they've all they've definitely gone down since Trump has been in charge. He can point to a graph and say, look, the numbers have gone down. It's just questionable if that is as a result of Trump's policies or despite of, despite them. We've also had in the chat um, a mention about his pro-cyclical uh, tax bill. <laughs> I hope I'm talking about this correctly, but it's, it's his sort of big tax cut. Um, his big tax plan that came through uh, at the end of last year, I believe. It was sort of one of his few achievements he could point to and say, I've got through that 
got that through the Senate. I think the basic idea was that, you know, all Republicans believe that there should be tax cuts and you should cut taxes. And the idea was that the tax cuts would pay for themselves. The economy would grow so fast that it wouldn't matter that we were taking less tax. It would still pay the same amount, if not more, that could be put into public services. The tax bill has ballooned the deficit. Yes, thank you for correcting me there. That's um, Yeah, and, and that's the big worry. As I said, that he claimed that his tax cuts would pay for themselves. They aren't. And if it continues in that vein, then he could be putting the US in a, in a hole, uh, particularly if trade starts to slow and the tariffs don't work uh, and the global economy starts to slow. So it's certainly a, a big risk. There may have been some short term gain. Um, and I know that the tax cuts were sort of aimed at attracting a middle class voter as well, saying there'll be more money in your pocket, thanks to me. Uh, but the actual real term effect on the country might be a lot more painful. So that's us through the headlines. Um, normally, we try and have a headline here that relates into our main story. But I think maybe that's an interesting point we can mention here. So what is our main story this week, Rob? Yeah, so uh, let's just spin the wheel of news to see what we're going to be talking about this week. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's Brexit again. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I think the wheel is broken. Um, no, the wheel is just seventy percent Brexit and like twenty nine percent Trump, and there's like a slither that might be other news. But yes, um, <laughs> apologies, but it, it is Brexit. But it's a slightly different Brexit story. Or at least we're not looking at it from Theresa May's side. Um, so we're talking about the big protest march that happened last week, the People's Vote March. Uh, I don't know if, did you know anyone who attended the march? I know a lot of people who attended, actually, yes. Um, a lot of people on my Facebook feed uh, encouraging people to go, pictures of them at various stages of going on the march. I probably know, I would say at least six or seven people were actively posting on Facebook, encouraging people to go and also, you know, were there and I've seen photos of them there. Um, I wasn't able to go, I mean, I've not been to any of these marches. I would have gone if I'd been free. I was busy looking after um, some 14 to 18 year olds running around, <laughs> like doing some hiking in, in, in the middle of uh, the countryside. But um, yeah, I, I, I would have gone, I think, had I had the opportunity, you know, it's just for me, it's easy, just oyster card in would have been interesting to see. And I think it's kind of in, so there's two things. One, one they expected maybe a hundred thousand people to turn out. I think they expected and there were 700,000, which is a big number. That is a lot of people. That is, wait, isn't that, a, that is a, like 1% of the UK population, roughly. <laughs> roughly. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a big old march. It was the second biggest march, political march ever. It, I think the only bigger one was the Stop the Iraq War march. Um, at least that happened in the UK. So, And that, that, that was probably as effective as sadly this one will be. Hmm. <laughs> yes <laughs> i mean we definitely went to war in iraq if i recall correctly so yes yes yeah, so I, I guess of people who don't really know what it's about or at least uh what it was so the 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 people's vote march was uh a campaign um that was simply asking for a people's vote on brexit uh so to make this clear it's it's not a vote to run the referendum again so it's not a simple, do you want to stay in or stay out? Uh, they would argue that this would be a referendum on the deal that May comes back with from her negotiations with the EU. Uh, so she comes back with, you know, oh, I've got checkers through. The EU has agreed to it. Uh, oh, by the way, let's just check that the general public want this before we go through with it. Um, so there are some people who on the march might say that, you know, they could argue that it's not a bid to stop Brexit. Um, it, it's just a way to get people's voice to be heard. Um, that being said, I would say that most of, if not all of the people on that march were very pro-Remain. Uh, and the view is that they would be likely to reject any deal that came back from Theresa May, uh, unless it was kind of, we're going to remain in the European Union, um, but we'll be out in sort of like name only, if you get what I mean. Uh, yeah, so so that's the that's the idea, and it certainly is like a a remain based thing. What I wanted to look at is the the pros and cons of each argument, like the the arguments from the remain side and what they'd say, and then I'd like to balance that with how a how a Brexiteer may respond to those to those claims. Uh, and I think 
I, I think you feel free to like jump in with your own arguments and 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 challenge me. I think all these arguments deserve to be challenged and scrutinized, and there's certainly strengths and weaknesses in both. So before we just before we dive into that, one thing I want to mention. So I alluded to it in my introduction to this bit. I I wonder it would be interesting if our listeners would comment with this, like how how much they heard about this because all of the news I got about it was via Facebook. That's not to say it wasn't covered. It was covered on BBC News, but I think there was a general impression that it wasn't covered as much as it should be by uh, the BBC. Now, this is an interesting thing that's come up a few times before. I mean, I think we've touched on BBC bias and things like this. The BBC has a tendency to bias towards the current government, but they are supposed to be impartial, especially with news broadcasts. Um, And it's one of these interesting things where I kind of wonder, like, it made it to, I think it was the sixth entry on the front page. Um, and obviously, so let, let's take an example of something very big, like the presidential election, Trump being voted in. That was obviously always going to be the top story on the on the news page that day, because it is important world news. It, it Trump, I mean, literally trumps uh, everything else going on that day, unless there was some terrible um, cataclysmic event at the same time. Um, so... I'm guessing here. I don't know how the algorithm on the BBC website works exactly, but I imagine there are two components. One is there must be some kind of uh, some editorial um, control, and also that there must be some that there is like a a most read thing. They must be seeing how many people click on a a, an article. So say let's take the presidential election. That's news that people are expecting. It's been built up. People are going to go check to see the result, but also the editor will come in and put it like, "This is one of the most important news stories. It should be on the top of the on the top of the front page." And then obviously people will click on it more and keep it there. Um, I wonder, in a case of something like this, like how many you know? So if there's seven hundred thousand people on the march, most of those people are presumably not checking their own news coverage at that moment. So the most interested people are probably not checking the website and putting it up the rankings. And where do you, as an editor, I wonder where you make that decision of where to put it in, like on on the top stories, because there is, I I, I can't go back and tell you what was a, uh, on the top story. Actually, hang on, <laughs> think way back, way back <laughs> <Yeah>. machine. <laughs> no, it is. Uh, I, I mean, while you're looking for that, it is uh, the job of an editor is crucial to how the news is represented, and yeah, it's maybe the least kind of. It's only the job of one person, and how accountable that person is, uh, you never really know. Sorry, uh, what did you find? There are 21 snapshots on that day. Mm-hmm. Um, the top article was Turkey to reveal all on Khashoggi death. The second article was March's call for people's vote on Brexit. And it had literally just been posted. It was a minute out. So I, I think that's pretty good, really. I, th- I think I think this is a thing where people tend... So, so if, if you're really passionate about it, obviously it's the most important issue in the news right now to you. But the fact that it got second after a very important international event that was suddenly in the news um, yeah. with the, Saud- you know, the Saudi killing, like, that is, to put it second, considering it's local news compared to that, um, you know, you could argue one of these is more important um, for various reasons but like the other one had been out for an hour probably had people viewing it already to put it in as the next big story after a minute it, i think is quite good actually um i think that shows that it's probably been done well it's just when you look at the news later on in the day i'm now going to go see what happens if i click on say that evening i wonder if it's dropped down the news cycle so if we look at eight o'clock the same evening waits for everything to load <laughs> while i wait for this to load by the way the Wayback machine is an amazing resource and definitely needs more people to donate to it it's just great you can go and click on basically any website that's ever been and find old versions of the page you might not find all the the photos yeah so at 8 p.m that same day it was still the second second highest article and there's actually quite a nice photo in the thumbnail of like all the marchers from above which basically shows them swarming through what i imagine it, i can't tell which park that is like you can see trees amongst them but it's just people so yeah that's i mean i will, I will make sure to get that article up so that I can put it in the show notes. But yeah, I, I think it was fairly covered. And I think possibly it's uh, the BBC once again being in... I think there are fair criticisms of the BBC. I don't think they're perfect. But I think we we are very lucky to have uh, the kind of recording the, uh, reporting the BBC tends to give us. Yeah, c- certainly. Um, I'm going to go off on a, a, just a slight tangent. I remember from uh, my studies, we talked about uh, news and, and framing and different models of news. And... You know, as you talk about the the killing that was on top, that might be that might be based further forward because it would have more of a global impact. 
as in global impact events have more than local have more sort of like importance than local impact events as it said um there's also kind of a <laughs> the effect was sort of like the the fire alarm effect i think it was if there's like a short sharp problem that can be solved or something that's big and flashy that tends to go up rather than something long term so for example uh you could argue that global warming has a has the biggest impact on our planet why isn't it headlines every single day uh the media would go back and say well that's boring and there's you know to have it every day would just be wearing for the viewer we've got to mix it up so that's where they have these different stories so there's yeah there's a lot that goes into being an editor and what makes it makes it on the front page but i I think in this case the 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 people's march got its got its due uh, on the bbc and and i mean just a quick aside as well we've our our live listeners on the discord have also mentioned that they heard about it um in in various countries around the world so Although, admittedly, part of that might be the fact that they are on Discord servers with people like us who discuss these things. So, so you know, maybe skewed. But I think I think the news got out there is my point. Sorry, so, so back to your main points then. So, yeah, so just a couple of the main points. So the, the main arguments for and against this march, um, why it's doing. And I'm probably going to be saying a lot of the stuff that I've said all the time when we've talked about Brexit. But I just wanted to throw a real spotlight on it and, and show kind of the the argument and counter arguments from each point so um one of the main reasons why people think it should happen is uh because the, the referendum had such a close result uh so 48 52 we all we all know that that was the that was the result um it was close um possibly you know too close to call um on the on the night of the referendum before we knew the result and when polls predicted that uh Remain would leave. Sorry, Remain would win instead of leave. Uh, Nigel Farage commented that um, if the result was 52-48 the other way, um, it would be far from over this vote. So Remainers kind of see it as hypocritical for Brexiteers saying the argument that we won, get over it, when actually when they thought it was going to be the other way around, they'd keep, you know, the Brexiteers would keep fighting for it. The other big issue is that many argue that an issue of this size needs a bit more of a it doesn't just need a simple majority it needs a super majority uh so for example in montenegro uh, they had a vote for independence um and that needed a 55 percent vote to pass uh in the usa changes of the size need like a, a two-thirds majority to pass um and the upside of that often means that you know the mood in the country is better it's more acceptant to change a lot more people are on the side uh yeah, there's a lot of benefits to having uh, having that done. So I think that's one of the big reasons why people think that there should be another vote to make it happen again. Against that, from the Brexiteers' point of view, uh, they would argue that there's still a clear victor. There weren't any recounts. There were no sort of disputes. There was still a clear victor. Uh, and, and also, they might be quite right in saying that it was it was a remainer in David Cameron that set the rules for this referendum. And if he wanted to be serious about it, maybe he should have said that he wanted the two thirds rule uh, before he called it. You know, then we would have no recourse to complain. Now it is kind of very easy for Brexiteers to say that, uh, you know, we're sore losers. I think from a you know, I'm a Remainer. From a Remainer's point of view, I don't think I would have been pressing. You know, I don't think I would have been keen on. Brexiteers having a second referendum in, you know, just two years after the result of the first, you've always got to look at it as if the shoe's on the other foot. And yeah, certainly I would have been annoyed or, or you know, or, or worried that I think in the current climate, I might be even more worried that, you know, that the possibility of a of Brexit might be even more likely. And I wouldn't want the vote just to be keep running again and again and again until you find get the result that you want. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I agree that running referendums again and again and again until you get what you want is kind of defeats the point. Um, and I think we've already meant, touched on in previous episodes how, I mean, really, we just shouldn't have had the referendum, right? Like, it was a bit silly. But yes, I, I very much think that, I think it is an entirely reasonable criticism, well, oh, you can't now say you want a two-thirds majority because it wasn't what was in the original uh, vote. That that's That's entirely fair. Um, although equally, my return, com- my rebuttal to that would be, well, we can't, you know, we can have whatever type of Brexit we want then, because all we said was we would leave the European Union. That doesn't mean we have to leave with a no deal or any of this stuff that's like just rhetoric. Like that was not on the paper. 
if you're going to take that argument with me um that the paper didn't say two-thirds majority well then okay the paper also didn't say what brexit was so you just have to accept what happens essentially <laughs> like if you're going to get in a hissy fit about i'd be like oh well, we want we want a no deal or or whatever your particular thing is like the, the exact same argument stands which is what we've I think we have criticized the referendum itself several times. And I think those are clear. Those are good criticisms of it. And I don't think we should have had a 50, 50 referendum on this because it was a silly idea. Um, I, you know, it, 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 you know, the people who are going on these marches, the reason I would have wanted to go on that March if I was free is, you know, to make the point that like, we didn't like, we didn't sign up for there to be a 50, 50 referendum in the first place. Like, that was Cameron's decision because he was like, oh, it'll be fine. You know, that's kind of annoying. And I think, like, I think referendums probably should be two thirds majority in general. Like, I think that's probably a good idea if you're going to change something significant about the country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could break it out and say that the decision to have the referendum on the term that, on the terms that Cameron defined was only supported by 35% or whatever the percentage was that voted for the Conservatives in the 2015 election. Exactly. You know, if you're re- yeah. if you're really looking for who's responsible and it, is that is that fair? I mean, we we talked in some of our you know silly season episodes about first past the post and how it's weird and how you, you rarely get over fifty percent in a first past the post system anyway. So it would be um, you know super unlikely that anybody would have just a a very definitive way to set that referendum up. But yeah, it does seem like a small a, a tiny part of the country you know in comparison has been able to set the rules for something that w- affects definitely affects a hundred percent of it. Um, in yeah, yeah, quite a big way. Uh, yeah, I th- I think that I think your points sort of saying that you don't know what it wasn't clear what Brexit was when we voted at the time or what it was sort of leads into the next one, which is the next comment that why the people's vote exists is that they argue that the vote was sort of flawed or that people had misinformation that if they went into a vote now, they may vote differently. Uh, So for example, we've, we talked about vote leave campaign having broken funding rules or allegedly done that. Um, there's also, you know, the, I think the the well trodden line of like promises about the three hundred and fifty million pounds a week, etc. Something that was, you know, we'll take the three hundred and fifty million we give to the EU and give it to the NHS. Uh, I I don't think that promise has really even come up in Brexit negotiations, but that's like the lasting campaign line I feel from that referendum. Interesting. I will have to see if I can find it to throw into the show notes. But there was an article I saw shared on Facebook earlier this week that something like a majority of people still believe that lie okay <laughs> because it was so well advertised so it's like yeah. probably because it hasn't like like we we know that it it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the case but like as you say because it hasn't kind of been brought up that much since if people accepted it the first time they may still they, i think that's probably what it was but i'll have to find the article to throw in the show notes no that's th- that's a good point and like the main the main Brexiteer argument about them saying that the vote was flawed or people didn't know what they were voting for, or that there's lots of different Brexits available, um, you know, and they might not get what they want, is that even as, I think even as Remainers, um, we can't say with any degree of certainty what would happen if we left the EU. I think I'm certain that there would be a bigger risk of, you know, things going bad for the country, but I can't say that with any certainty. Um, and there's uh, Brexiteers kind of have a bit of plausible deniability when it comes to those those facts. We don't know the full in economic impact of Brexit yet. Um, one of the big things that Remainers predicted after the referendum was that there would be a massive economic crash. And I think countless sort of financial uh, predictions said that the UK economy would be in a much worse state now as a result of just the fact that people knew we were leaving the EU. That hasn't quite happened yet. So Brexiteers, in a way, still have something to point to, and they they can still wag a finger and say that oh, the the doom and gloom and you know project fear didn't work, and it, and it hasn't worked yet. Uh, I think the I think the main remain argument would be well, we haven't left the European Union yet. Until we leave, we won't know what the impact is. Uh, so yeah, it, it's hard. No, no, I, I may regret saying this on a political podcast where we try and tell you what's going on, but in truth, not many people really know what's going on with Brexit. I, I listen to a couple of other political podcasts and a lot of them are just 
worn out with Brexit or feel that if they take their eye off the news for two minutes, then they lose the thread. They don't know what's happening from day to day. Um, and it's tiring and it's annoying and, and you don't really know where it's going. Uh, and that does give Brexiteers that kind of wiggle room to say, hey, maybe it'll be maybe it'll be fine. You can't say for certain that it will be all doom and gloom. Yeah. Um, so we've had, we've had a, a point from the chat there that yeah. another big con to a second referendum is that we're currently undergoing negotiations so so we have we have discussed um previously like how we couldn't go and make a trade deal uh with another country until we've like left um the eu for various reasons because because it affects the incentives for, for both parties and what you might agree to and and i think that's a good point the, the second referendum uh if you're if you're going into a negotiation but but like say say we went over to to the eu and we're, we're having this negotiation we want this we want this but there's a chance that we're suddenly going to say, oh, no, actually, we're staying in the EU. That really affects how that negotiation goes, because they might press for a really hard negotiation tactics to make it seem worse because they want us to stay in the EU, which will encourage people in that second referendum to vote to stay because the de- the like the threat of a no deal, et cetera, would be worse than, than staying, um, as an example. Yeah, that's, that's a very sort of like kind of four dimensional chess way of putting it, you know, like a game within the game. Um, yeah. But 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 I I agree with it, and I mean that's that's why the the People's Vote campaign was so much, so supported by Remainers is because certainly any vote to propose it in that manner would be would undermine negotiations. It would undermine the Prime Minister. It would put their authority at, at risk. Most people, when they're doing negotiations, want to negotiate with just the Prime Minister, and then you know they, they've even the Prime Minister had some power taken away from her. Um, because the law said that it had to go through the Houses of Parliament, which is unpredictable in a sense, by giving it to the general public, that's even more unpredictable. And that means that there's a greater chance it would it would fail. And I think if any vote came through and it was rejected by the public, then the Prime Minister would have to almost resign immediately. Uh, you saw it with David Cameron on the day after he lost the referendum. He put his heart and soul into that and said sorry, you know, I'm not the right person to lead the country in this direction because I so clearly campaigned for the other side. Um, it's a good point raised in the chat that the head negotiator, the PM, did want to remain. Uh, I think Theresa May has, you know, stressed that she is following the will of the people. We've heard that line a lot. And she says that it's important for democracy that the will of the people is respected and that it goes ahead. But equally, I think she's been caught on camera saying things along the lines of she's refused to say we would be better off staying in the EU or something to that effect. She's she you know refused to she refused to say either way. She's refused to be drawn on the question of whether we will be better off in or outside the European Union, which may show that she's not the most staunch uh, Brexiteer. Personally, I don't think that even though Theresa May may have voted Remain in the first place, it's not in Theresa May's interest to give in and, and, and give this vote or, or, or give it to people. Um, I don't think she would do it to try and undermine the position of Brexiteers and make us stay in the EU via stealth. She's pinned her colours to the mast quite a few times that she's, you know, she's meant to be Mrs. Brexit. She's meant to be the person who gets through this period. I, th- I think a lot of people might agree that she may not have been the, I don't know, it'd be too harsh. Um, I, I think that her leadership skills have certainly been called into question. She was sort of the person caught with, you know, the music stopped and suddenly she was prime minister and she had to deal with it. You know, <laughs> yeah. nobody else Musical wanted chairs to take gone it. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else wanted to take it. Uh, she said, okay, uh, I may not have agreed with this in the first place, but come on, let's get it, get it done. And she's had lots of opportunities in the past, I think, where her authority has been undermined. She could have resigned after the 2017 election. Um, it didn't do it. She could have passed the reins on. It's, it's not like there aren't people who really want it now. You know, you've got David Davis waiting in the wings thinking that, you know, he's the man to lead the country. Uh, yeah. In short, I, I don't think that she'll be pursuing a second referendum in that manner to try and stay in the EU by stealth. It's kind of the point when, when we mentioned this at the start as well, and I think you did you allude to the fact that you thought that it was really unlikely that this campaign would have any chance of getting off the ground at all? Yeah, essentially, I um, I I mean, you you mentioned that it was uh, the second biggest march and the biggest one was to try and prevent the Iraq War. Well, the Iraq War happened. There, you know, I. 
Oh, I was saying it in a jokey way, but I feel like this probably won't have an effect now, sadly, because, you know, the, pe- the people making these decisions are the Conservative Party. I imagine, why, like, I know we know, I know that there are Remainers within the Conservative Party, but a lot of the people who are out there um, marching today are very much not their demographic voters. They were young, uh, young students who tend not, you know, as a, as a group, you know, pe- people our age, maybe younger, who tend to uh, vote more Labour, more Lib Dem, um, more Green. And so I feel like, I mean, <laughs> there's no incentive for them to change based on the fact that this march happened, sadly. I, th- I don't think it will change the course that they, they've got set. No. Um, your your views are backed up by um, a recent YouGov poll as well, um, which suggested that only one in five Brits think that a second referendum is likely. Uh, and, and even amongst Remainers, uh, what was it? Only, only about 24% of Remainers thought it was likely. 22% of Remain voters thought it was very unlikely. So this was... I don't feel that this vote was going to change anything, but it certainly showed like a big protest vote. Uh, We've mentioned in previous episodes how both main parties now support Brexit wanting to go forward, uh, which has left 48% of the country or or a large amount of people feeling quite frustrated um, that their voice isn't being heard in some way. And I I feel that this march was a way, uh, like it was almost like a safety valve event, uh, a way of showing the world that no, we're still here. We still really want to remain we think this is a big issue um and certainly like we mentioned as public protests go it it had a big impact you know being one of the biggest um making front page news on the bbc uh it wasn't just a a small one which i think i think vote leave had tried some similar campaigns just in some similar marches i mean in the days before and they detracted a handful of people so this in response showed that there's at least some you know, great degree of unity on the Remain side, and they're still very vocal about the way that they think the the direction of the country should go in. I don't really have much more to add. I feel <laughs> uh, no. Um, the only thing I want wanted to add really was that the other big argument is that people say like it's it's been two years. Opinions may have changed, um, and I think one of the like one of the crudest ways people say that is that oh loads of old people voted brexit they've all died and all the young people supported remain so they're bound to vote and that'll be that'll be enough the maths works out that if just the same people all voted again that that almost the, the leavers would lose so much through attrition that the remainers would automatically win for me that notion is really ridiculous and to go in to assume that everybody would just vote exactly the same way again, I think is a little naive. Um, just because there was this discrepancy between young and old doesn't mean that people may have changed their mind. I've I raised the question of a second referendum against uh, a bunch of friends who I would say are not maybe the most politically active or politically engaged. Uh, and I think it's really important to remember that, you know, their vote counts as much as my vote. In a perfect society, everyone would be perfectly politically engaged, but it's it's not going to happen. Um, and small things and, you know, like feelings like that really matter. And a lot of them, even though they voted Remain, said, oh, I can't be bothered with a second referendum. I think we should just get on with it. I think we should just leave and see what happens because I've had enough of us just doing nothing, which surprised me in a sense. I think if I had the chance, I would vote Remain every single day of the week if I could um, to stop it. But that that sense amongst the general public this i was talking about brexit fatigue earlier i think it's really seeped in there and 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 those who aren't politically active you just couldn't count on their vote to vote exactly the same way exactly the same way again uh those seven hundred thousand people who marched who took trains to go there who you know took the time out of their day to design signs um i don't know if you've included a side point but i don't know if you included the sign did you see the the sign that went around the internet that said uh this is like when Jerry Hallowell overestimated her ability as a solo artist. Yes, um, yes. I, that did filter through despite the fact I was in a field. <laughs> yes. Uh, the sign, the, you know, Remainer's sign game, really on point. Really, really good. Um, but yeah, those 700,000 people represent the most politically active, the most ferocious, the most, you know, dedicated supporters. It's clear that they've got the energy. Uh, I'm just not sure that the rest of the country would share that energy given a chance to vote on it again. Uh, so I think I'll begin as a starter, at least, um, I think, 
the second referendum or this people's vote march, uh, although it was a really good exercise for those participating in, I think it's really, really unlikely that it's ever going to happen, unfortunately. Sorry, we, we mentioned that sign and, and I, I've got it in tweet form to go in the show notes, but we didn't actually uh, finish the joke. Um, and some of our listeners, uh, live <laughs> listeners, were, were a bit, uh, um, <laughs> didn't quite, I hadn't seen it. So I think we'll just throw it in here so you understand. Brexit is a bit like when Jerry Halliwell overestimated her potential as a solo artist and subsequently decided to leave the Spice Girls. So there you go. Full joke. I hope I hope that gave you a chortle. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, sadly, it's too long, I think, to make a show title. Um, so, so in the chat, we have uh, a point that under Nixon, millions of people marched to end the war in Vietnam. And there was like probably an even larger counterculture than, you know, while while we hear a lot about remain, 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 like there aren't, there isn't like this this kind of wave of popular. I mean, that, that sounds wrong. Like th- there are, there is popular support f- from a group of people to to remain, but there isn't like this whole counterculture around it. Like like the hippie culture, all of that in America was very kind of founded in being anti that the establishment, anti um, Vietnam, and all of that. And yeah, so d- despite all of that, like the war in Vietnam continued for a long time, and. The majority of the country probably still supported it like you could get millions of people out but if they're you know that doesn't necessarily mean something uh from a voting point of view like if if there's still enough republicans sitting around uh, voting for republican reasons it doesn't matter if you get half the democrats in the country to walk around you know yeah it was uh nixon called it uh, and it was in one of his sort of like most famous speeches uh the silent majority um which is a you know a common term. Um, he you know pointed the camera and said, "You, the silent majority, are basically saying that I know that there's a lot of protests going around, but I know a lot of you secretly in your hearts support the Vietnam War and support me in what I'm doing, and that's why I'm going to continue what I'm doing." Um, you know, the problem with the silent majority, I would argue, is that y- you can never. <laughs> it, it's harder to know that they're there because they're silent rather than the very visible protests. Um, but it showed a real divide amongst those people who were stringently against the uh, Vietnam War and those who supported it, but may feel that they were pressured or, or, or unable to speak out about it. Uh, I know even before, maybe I mean, uh, Brexit is similar in a sense, because I think before Brexit, there were, you know, people who were maybe shy Brexiteers, afraid to speak out in front of people, um, knowing that they lived in a very sort of like pro-Remain office or a very pro-Remain environment. Uh, they may have just outwardly said they were going to vote remain and and went to the ballot box and and did something very different yeah and i mean the silent majority has been brought up in the context of brexit because there is it it is definitely not popular to be racist i think is a fair statement to make so if uh the general i say the general opinion the opinion the kind of there's the outward social opinion that this idea of leaving europe etc is is racist in a way and and it comes from that especially stuff with like the edl and and BNP that led into kind of UKIP, th- those ideas are seen as uh, are gen- generally described and derided in in the pop in pop culture and stuff as as racist. So, if some someone could support Brexit for reasons that are not that, but they wouldn't have brought it up in conversation because they're like, well, I'm pro Brexit, and but then they would get shouted down by their colleagues. And and I think that has been a big issue here because it means I mean, that that's what you know people didn't expect the vote to go that way because they were just like there can't be that many people who vote for Brexit, right? And, and we were obviously wrong. Um, so I think there is, yeah, there's an issue there. There's kind of the socialization of these things. What things are things people think in private that are not socially acceptable to say, and people can learn that those are not socially accept- acceptable things to say, doesn't stop them thinking them necessarily. And, and in some cases, that there is um, there is research in like the psychological literature about how if your if your ideas are challenged, it can tend to lead to you feeling stronger in your original ideas which is part of how we get this polarization in politics especially whereas what's better actually is just to talk to that person show that show them that you're a real person who is like them regardless of your views and and i think possibly we've touched on this as like coalitions versus first past the post like first past the post drives this kind of polarizing structure whereas like having more coalitions means you have you, you have to but to get anything done kind of compromise on stuff and that means there's a more measured view on things 
I feel like I've not necessarily made a point there, but I've, <laughs> I've said a lot of ideas that are kind of related. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can't. It's it's hard to solve the problem of political polarization overnight. So we'll um we'll put we'll we'll work on that one in the background. Um, yeah, see how we go. That moves very well onto our sort of polling tangent, which this week uh, I thought we'd focus on the on the midterms uh, instead instead of the. It's just because the midterms are just around the corner, so. Uh, Having a look, at, <laughs> having a look at the um, at the polling over there, I think is really important. Uh, particularly when people might say there was sort of a proposed, uh, there was an effect in the last election, uh, in the presidential election in 2016. When you think about how many polls predicted a Clinton win, and everybody was quite shocked when Trump came through, it's worth having a look and seeing if the polls are still in that sort of coin flip area, um, or if they've changed since then. So. The person I like to rely on is Nate Silver. 538, yeah. 538, um, who I think is the best at this. Uh, he was another one who, at the time of, in 2016, predicted uh, that Clinton would win. Uh, although, if you go back and look at the look at the polling and the actual results, you'll actually see that in 2016, a lot of pollsters predicted the national vote percentage correctly, um, but got it wrong in the in the states. And, and that was reflected in the result in that Hillary got so many more million votes than Trump did, but failed to win the states that she needed. So uh, anyway, uh, moving on, I think these polls are quite accurate. So we've got votes going on in all the seats in the House uh, and in a third of the Senate. Uh, in the House, the current prediction uh, is that there's an 85 percent chance that the Democrats will win control. However, when we go to the Senate... Um, the story is quite different, showing that there's a five in six chance that Republicans keep control of the Senate. I would say that that's definitely not in toss up territory. That's almost certainly what's going to happen come Election Day. It's Nothing is ever certain in politics and you can't trust polls down to there. But, you know, clearly the the 55, 45 percent split that there was for Clinton and Trump is very different to an 85 percent split on either side. Uh, I think the reasons for the reasons between the difference between the House and the Senate are, uh, and we've talked about this briefly in the past, is that in the House they're electing everybody all over again, and I think that sort of reflects the public mood uh, on how Trump's doing as a president. Uh, Nate Silver also does a Trump approval rating, uh, and that has started to go down in recent weeks. So I believe at the moment it's. 52.5% of people disapprove of Trump but it looks like it looks like more people disapprove previously yes um so you've got the big disapprovals historically were uh, when he fired James Comey um and when the healthcare failed to go through i think that's when it sort of hit its peaks at around about 57% ever since then he's been creeping back up to around about the 42% mark uh and it was creeping. So you got up to 43% at the end of October, but that's just started to dip back down again now. I would say the economic news has probably affected Trump a little bit. Uh, I mean, there's always something with Trump that goes on where he can suddenly switch his opinion. Um, but I think in recent in the recent month, he seemed to be doing a better job, or at least it was perceived by some that he'd at least been competent and managed to get a few sort of staunch Republican bills passed. Uh, now that seems to be changing a little, uh, but I think it's I think it's too late in the election cycle for anything big to happen to move those needles enough uh, to to balance it out again. Uh, so I think in the next podcast we'll certainly be focusing on the results of those elections. Even if we think it's quite certain that the Democrats will win the House and the Republicans will win the Senate, the other thing to look out for in those elections is what type of candidate is being elected by either side. Um, are we seeing further polarisation? Are we seeing more Trump-like candidates getting elected for Republicans? Um, or are we seeing you know, more moderates getting elected? Um, equally on the Democratic side, are we seeing more Sanders-esque, more left-wing candidates getting voted in? Uh, the midterms will give us some idea of the ideological direction the two parties will be going into uh, or what they think might be successful uh, going into the 2020 presidential elections. Cool. So I think that's us uh, for today. Um, so we're just going to wrap up. Is there any, uh, do you have any final notes you want to add, Rob? No, no, it's just, no, thank you. And thank you once again, chat, for, for you know, all your suggestions. It's been really nice to 
go off on those tangents <laughs> with you and, and explore those um, and, and for putting me right again. So yeah, just a big thanks to chat. Yeah. And I mean, as we mentioned before, you can find in the show notes uh, a link to our Discord server. We're more than happy to have you come along and listen uh, to our recordings. We should be back to a normal schedule now that um, Rob has, uh, you know, sanitation. <laughs> um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, some of those tangents won't necessarily end up in the episode as they have to be cut for time. So if you come and join us uh, in the Discord, you will get like the full the full experience, as as, as they say. So come along and join us. Um, you can also find us on Facebook at Unparliamentary Language, Reddit at forward slash r forward slash Unparliamentary, on Twitter and on Instagram now at Unparl Podcast, and of course you can find us on our website at Parliamentary Observer and Patreon.com forward slash TTSS, where you can sponsor the show, um, and and you know. A little bit of money to go towards uh, the cost of the website would be great. We have managed to sort out Rob a slightly better microphone now. Um, Yay! Can you hear me? Is it good? Is it good now? How good is it now? <laughs> Can I get closer to the microphone. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Oh dear, my ears. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Sorry. That's all right. Sorry. Um, hopefully, you haven't killed your shiny new toy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, yeah so as always thank you for joining me Rob thanks to the chat for coming along and listening and, and keeping us on the straight and narrow and throwing uh, tangents our way and I think it's good night from me and it's a uh, good night from him bye bye bye, bye. bye. sorry this is l- some live reporting here <laughs> <laughs>